Hey guys, and welcome back to the FFP. Today we'll be going over our week six waiver wire claims that you need to make. As always, we're gonna be discussing a lot, and I mean a lot of players. Hopefully that will get you at least a couple of options, and then you can decide which options you like best to help shore up your lineup this week. We've certainly learned a lot coming out of week five, but for those of you who have, I don't know, at least one point of IQ, you recognize that Rob is not here. I'm going to discuss that mostly at the end of the video, uh, but I will say right now it is due to an absolute just crazy amount of things have been happening right now. So I took over the entirety of this video and I'm going to be with you guys presenting you everything that you need to know. As always, there will be timestamps down in the description. Feel free to drop a comment down below if you want help. And I'd like to ask you guys for a favor. Rob is out of town uh, with a family member who's having some health issues and he is completely unable to participate. And so we were already at a place where answering questions was a little bit difficult. It's going to be even harder for me now that I have to answer all the questions and do all the work for the video. And so I'd ask you guys, if you see a comment and you have an opinion on it, just say, hey, this is what I think. Help try to answer each other's comments and that can help make up for the comments that I am unable to get to. As always, I don't want to waste any more of you guys' time or have to hear my awful voice any longer. So let's get into it and we can talk about our first couple of guys. And as always, for some reason, we like to start with the wide receivers. I don't know what that is, but it's what we do. Now, before we can get into it, uh, we're going to be talking about Will Fuller as our first guy. I'll let you know that, yes, I'm using paper notes today because my phone broke and I forgot to mention in the intro, bye weeks are the Buffalo Bills, Chicago Bears, Indianapolis and Colts. Uh, excuse me, Indianapolis Colts and Oakland Raiders will all not be playing this week. So now we can get into it and talk about Will Fuller. Now he's only 23% available, but we have to talk about this guy. The week that he had last week was monstrous. It was big enough that no matter what sort of league you're in, you at least have to take a look at him. I don't care if you're in a eight team league, this guy should be owned. I mean, look at the numbers. He had 16 targets, 14 catches, 217 yards and three touchdowns. Those numbers are absolutely phenomenal and reminiscent of the Will Fuller that we have seen in years past. They used to be a huge, really sleeper stud that people thought was going to have a breakout season. Hasn't quite been able to do that and get into that top tier level of wide receivers. Definitely had some struggles, but uh, as I mentioned, he's done this sort of thing before. In 2017, he had a four game stretch where he scored seven touchdowns. Last season, he had three touchdowns in his first three games until injuries derailed him and the rest of his season looked quite ugly. I think the team got very nervous with him and what they had to do last year where they had Demarius Thomas and Kiki Kuti. They had all these different guys there. And so this year they felt like they needed to do that again and they went out and got Kenny Stills. Kenny Stills seriously hurt Will Fuller's value but sure enough, Stills is out this week, and look at the kind of day that Will Fuller has. Now, as long as Stills is out, Fuller has big time value. Stills comes back, that will certainly hurt his value, uh, but I think he'll be better than he was before because I think as the Houston Texans, as Deshaun Watson, you have to recognize the value of this guy and realize that um, he needs to be a bigger part of that offense. So that right there is Will Fuller. Let's keep moving on because I swear there's like 60 different wide receivers I have to talk about. This is gonna be a long video. Uh, and the next guy I wanted to discuss is Cortland Sutton, 24% available, not extremely highly available, but with three touchdowns in the last two games, uh, he has really started to work some things out. His fantasy numbers are starting to uh, improve, and that is as a product of that offense that has really started to work some things out and found their groove. That backfield is fixing some things, and I tell you what, they look a lot better this year. He's got 16 targets, 10 catches, and 154 yards in the last two games. The, the numbers have been there. Cortland Sutton should be owned. That much is simple. Let's move on to our next guy. And so now we've got, uh, as they call him, Scary Terry or Terry McLaurin. Not really sure where that nickname come, came from, although if I were a cornerback, I would be terrified lining up against him. He is so young and so talented, and he is 24% available. And he plays Miami uh, this week, which is a good matchup for them. He was quiet last week and leaving some people a little bit nervous, but he played the best defense in the NFL. That was the Patriots defense. Um, this is not me being a Patriots fan and saying that. Look at the numbers. Hands down this season, the Patriots have statistically been the best defense. Um, but he's averaging eight targets and 65 yards a game plus three touchdowns in four games that, that that's what he's doing this year the numbers are absolutely there the production is absolutely there last week was really his worst game of the season and it was against a very very good defense with a very confused and messed up offense now you go on to the Dolphins a much easier matchup this is going to be a good week for him. He should absolutely be on, not just for his matchup this week, but for how he's going to perform all season long. 
All right, so wanted to take a second to talk about Marquez Valdez Scantling and Geronimo Allison. Uh, MVS is 25% available and Allison is 63% available. Coming into this week with Devontae Adams out, they were supposed to get more targets and more production and they were supposed to have bigger days. And yet they didn't. So why didn't they? And are they still worth picking up? And this is what we really have to look at. First thing I want to say is what we learned and something that me and Rob talked about, not so much with Geronimo Allison, more with Marcus Valdez Scantling, but that maybe they weren't ready for this role. And this was something that we really had to evaluate. And I think that, that really kind of proved to be the case this week. Now, Dallas's defense um, going into this game had allowed the fifth fewest fantasy points to wide receivers. If you look at the wide receivers they'd faced, hardly been elite wide receivers, so that number is hard to measure. I would say they are a average to above average pass defense, uh, but not quite as good as fifth best in the NFL. Uh, those guys seriously underperformed, uh, but a few things that really hurt them. Again, we talk about having to face up against those tougher matchups, but what really hurt them was Aaron Jones. He was insanely effective. His 27 touches, 182 yards, and four touchdowns completely removed those guys from needing to be factors. I believe the I didn't was able to uh, was unable, excuse me, to watch that Packers game. Um, live but i was checking on my phone i believe they got a 14 nothing pretty early on and from then on it was a lot in the ground game they a lot of times they were passing the ball simply to get a first down and move the chains forward to buy some time i don't think that they got used to their fullest potential so don't be too panicked by this week i still think that they are think that they are very much worth rostering though maybe this tempers our expectations a little bit Marvin Jones. Marvin Jones is an interesting situation because he's far from the most exciting wide receiver out there. Uh, but when you break down the numbers, he's a good bench wide receiver in fantasy. When you look at it, week one, he had uh, four for four. So he caught all four of his targets for 56 yards. Then he caught five targets for 43 yards. He had that big game against Philly. I think every wide receiver has a big game against Philly, but 101 yards, uh, six catches and a touchdown. Last week, even against Kansas City, he went five uh, five targets, three catches, 77 yards. Now, it's one of those things where the numbers have been good there. He's 26% available. You got to pick this guy up. He's had at least 10 fantasy points in every game this year. He is not a guy who's going to absolutely dominate for you. He's not the youngest, most talented, highest potential player, but he rounds out your wide receiving core with a safe option. I'm in a keeper league where I have many very risky choices at wide out, and I needed to go get one more safe guy. So I picked this guy up, and it was a nice small addition. I was very surprised he happened to be out there in that league but I guess we always say flukes happen and that's one of the things where you always have to keep yourself out there in the free agent waiver wire market and, and keep looking for these guys but that's Marvin Jones for you one of those guys who's not a sexy pick but should be rostered absolutely we've got wide receiver DJ Chark now I'm laughing and if you watch our channel every week you're probably uh, skipping the video right now because we've talked about DJ Chark in every single waiver wire video this season, and yet he's still 30% available, and I don't understand it. He comes out week one and gets 29 fantasy points, and he gets 18, and he gets 17. Last week, he had 45.4 fantasy points. This guy has, what, five touchdowns in five games? Why is he still out there? I don't care if you're in a 16-team uh, 16 league or an eight-team league. I don't care if you've got shallow benches, deep benches, PPR, standard, keeper, redraft, whatever. I don't care what your league is. This guy needs to be owned. DJ Chark is absolutely phenomenal. Um, watch any one of our other videos to learn about why. He was a project, and he's really finally developed into the wide receiver that Jacksonville drafted him to be. And, of course, he is meshing really well with Gardner Minshew. But I uh, just wanted to put him in here because with how available he is for his talent, you guys aren't surprised to hear him in this video, but I did have to do it. Sorry for kind of beating a dead horse, so to speak. But let's move on to a situation where I'm a little bit less excited about. And uh, now we're talking about Michael Gallup. Of course, when I just said I'm less excited about him, that was complete sarcasm. I couldn't be more excited about Michael Gallup. The production has been through the roof. He's played in just three games, and yet he's been phenomenal. He scored 26.3 fantasy points last week um, against Green Bay, 14 catches, or excuse me, 14 targets, seven catches, 113 yards, and a touchdown. Um, the numbers have been there. You look like week one. He comes out seven for seven, 158 yards. Uh, this guy has been so 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 phenomenal uh, he's a guy who's drafted to be dallas's number one wide receiver 
but he doesn't have the pressure of that. He's not facing number one corners. He has the pressure of, uh, excuse me, he has pr pressure relieved because of Mari Cooper, who is just phenomenal, it takes so much attention away from defenses. He's going to put up huge numbers. And this has got to be one of the best one-two punches in the NFL as far as wide receivers one and two go. I absolutely love Michael Gallup. And the dude is 33% available. That is stupidly highly available. Again, a lot of these guys aren't insanely highly available, but we want to talk about players who are genuinely worth picking up. So when we refer to 50 of them, hopefully in your league, at least one guy is available. Let's move on now to our next wide receiver. Wow, this has been very difficult for me apparently to speak properly. All right, so at 36% available, what about Robbie Anderson? Now, a lot of you people are probably rolling your eyes as he has been one of the biggest fantasy disappointments this season, but I think there's some really big things to like about him in this situation. First of all, we always say here at the FFP, volume is everything. I don't think I've ever exactly actually said that, but you get the point. We have always hit home the idea that half the battle being a good fantasy player is having volume and getting the ball a lot. And that's something that Robbie Anderson has done. Has the production been there like we wish it had been? No. But he's gotten 64 targets since week 14 of the 2018 season. That's tied for 12th best in the NFL. That right there is huge. He is hands down the number one wide receiver there for the New York Jets. So that is huge. Why hasn't the production been there? Well, first of all, you look at his schedule. He had to play the Buffalo Bills. Cleveland and then New England so two very tough defenses and actually Cleveland who gives up the 21st fancy points to wide receivers so actually three tough defenses two of them very tough and then he had a bye week comes back this week and plays the Philadelphia Eagles which is supposed to be a great matchup but what do you know it he doesn't have a quarterback this week so definitely one of those situations where uh, I feel like things were really stacked against him pick him up now while you can because he's going to get his quarterback back and he's going to get a much easier schedule. So take a look at this. He plays Miami, the New York Giants, Washington, Oakland, Cincinnati, Miami. He's got a good stretch there for a while. He just has to get through Dallas and New England coming up. And then, boom, this guy could really start to break out as a sleeper wide receiver. But I don't want to talk anymore about Robbie Anderson. So let's move on with this. And uh, here we've got D.D. Westbrook. This guy's been far from phenomenal, but with 11 targets, 7 catches, and 82 yards last week, he's starting to prove himself to be far from phenomenal, but uh, a safe and consistent PPR guy to put on your bench. And again, when you look at the matchups that they've had as well, Houston, Tennessee, Denver, and Carolina, specifically those last three, Tennessee, Denver, and Carolina, those are not easy matchups. Um, and he's had a consistent level of targets and catches, despite a game in, so, excuse me, um, if you exclude the game in Houston where they lost 13 to 12, which was really an anomaly, and I don't think it'll happen again this season that they have such a low scoring game. If you exclude that, he has had at least five catches in every game this year. Those are solid PPR numbers, and when you include that one game against Houston, he's had at least 10 fantasy points per game. I believe he's averaging about 13 fantasy points a game this season when you exclude the one against Houston. Again, um, there's been so little in this season. So little games and so little numbers to draw on that that one Houston performance, which was awful for Jacksonville as a whole, seriously devalued him and his statistics. But then when you really look into the numbers, he's really good for a 42% available wide receiver. I think uh, D.D. Westbrook is certainly a guy to look at. And uh, DK Metcalf, honestly, it really surprises me that this guy is as available as he is. He is 43% available. He looks very good as a rookie. He looks very polished and mature as a rookie. Um, he's a guy who's very physically talented. He's in very great shape, and he runs pretty good routes, actually. He seems to be really, he's got good hands and seems to be kind of the, the solid pass catching back in that offense. And the thing I like most about him is Russell Wilson, who is currently on pace for 38 touchdown passes. Um, 38 touchdown passes. Uh, that is absolutely huge. I think that DK Metcalf is a guy you have to go get now if you haven't already. In fact, I'm going to say it right now, if you're subscribed to our channel, I'm assuming you're smart enough to have already picked up this guy. Hopefully you have been. Not all of you will have been. But I tell you what, we have liked this guy for quite a while now. The numbers are there to support it. He's young. And dare I say, he is going to improve as a wide receiver. Seems very obvious, but something to not overlook for sure. All right, so we've got Deontay Johnson, this guy who in the, the preseason of this year, we didn't like very much because we heard that he wasn't a great route runner. His hands weren't great and he was dropping balls. 
But then when we come into the season, he's really started to turn things around. I don't know if those were false rumors. I don't know if um, things that were happening in practice were being blown up to be a bigger deal than they were, if James Washington was getting more hype than he deserved, what it may be. Um, but the numbers have been there, over the um, not phenomenally, but they've been pretty good, and so I should clarify that. But two weeks ago, he had back-to-back -back week with touchdowns. Last week, he had his second week in a row leading the Steelers in targets. Um, this is a guy to definitely consider. I would avoid picking him up. He has 66% available, so he's probably out there for you. I would avoid picking up right now. Mason Rudolph took a big hit from Earl Thomas, clearly got knocked out, and was carted off the field. I'm going to update you guys on Friday and catch you up with all the injury information that you guys need to know. Until then, I would probably avoid picking up Deontay Johnson, but he's a guy that you need to keep on your radar because if Rudolph is fine, then you should definitely pick him up. And again, it's one of those situations of be ready because the early bird gets the worm, so to speak. All right, now we get to talk about rookie wide receiver A.J. Brown. And this is a guy that I have been wanting to talk about since week one when he went out and had Four targets, three catches, and 100 yards. I believe that equated to 15 fantasy points. And I really wanted to talk about A.J. Brown, but just couldn't because he was still playing in this Tennessee offense as still not the number one wide receiver. And there was a lot of question marks. We need to give him some more time. And sure enough, we gave him some more time. And the numbers weren't quite as good as week one. Week two, he had three catches for 25 yards. Against Jacksonville in week three, he hit one catch for four yards, but then he really started to turn things around. You have to look at it. Uh, week four versus Atlanta, three catches, 94 yards, and two touchdowns. Then he comes back down against Buffalo last week, two catches for 27 yards. And, and that's why I want to talk about this guy because he is 67% available, and he has huge upside and huge downside. This is a guy to consider based on matchup, whether or not to pick him up that week. And if you have the bench depth, you could certainly roster him. But again, we're looking at it. He's very volatile. Against a team like Atlanta, he had a big day. Against a team like Cleveland, he had a big day. But he plays Jacksonville, he plays Buffalo, he struggles. And, and I think that comes down to the offensive issues as a whole. I think that comes down to him being a rookie and needs to learn some things. I think that comes to him down to him being really a speedster. You look at week one, three catches for 100 yards, that's great. Uh, but that's just three catches. And that means a lot of his plays were big burner plays. You also see the same thing in week four. He had 94 yards and two touchdowns off just three catches. And so I think this is a guy that I absolutely love. This is a guy I'm very excited about to see what he can do in the future. I don't yet think he's an awesome, awesome wide receiver, but if you have a bench spot open and you want to fill that bench spot with a wide receiver that is high upside, AJ Brown might be the guy to do that with. Again, very high upside, very low downside. Um, so just round you out on that player, very risky pick, but always would say if he's in this video, he's worth taking a look at. And I know that you guys are going to absolutely get on us, but I wanted to talk about Preston Williams. People are like, I hate the Dolphins players. you got to avoid them. But at 93% available, it's nice to talk about a guy that everyone has a chance to get. And it is important to know, and this is really only the big reason that I want to put him here, he has 19 targets in the last two weeks. Both weeks, back-to-back -back weeks, he has led the Miami Dolphins in targets. So he's far from the most amazing wide receiver, uh, but things are starting to look up for the rookie wideout who's really starting to prove himself. And I think by next year, he could very well show himself to be the clear-cut number one wide receiver on that roster ahead of Devontae Parker. I've got nothing more to say on this. He's a guy to watch, not stash, at least as of right now, unless you're in a 16-team league with a deep bench. Uh, and you guys know what I mean by that. But let's move on. I believe we have one more wide receiver that I would like to mention. So the last guy I wanted to talk about at wide receiver was Bengals wideout Auden Tate. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Auden, I believe, is how you pronounce it. At the beginning of this season, many of you, including I, probably didn't even know this guy's name or, like my case, barely knew who he was but brushed him off with all the other wide receivers on that roster. But A.J. Green goes down, and now John Ross is on the IR, and this guy starts to have some value. He has thir he's caught, excuse me, he's got 13 of his 22 targets for um, over 100 yards and a touchdown in the last three games. He's far from an elite wide receiver, and I don't think he has value that is going to last all season. But while we're in this John Ross, A.J. Green out period for a couple of weeks, a guy to put on your bench if you're desperate at wide receiver might be Auden Tate. He's exciting to talk about because I love to talk about these deep sleepers. I always get excited when I know about a player that I know not everyone even knows exists or is playing. Uh, but the numbers have been there. They've been okay. Again, when I say the phrase, the numbers have been there, I don't mean the numbers have been elite. I don't mean that they've been fantastic. Uh, but they've been there as in they've been big enough for me to notice. 
Um, and they've been big enough to maybe surprise me a little bit. Far from fantastic, but he is a guy to look at if you're desperate, if you're trying to replace John Ross. Though I doubt that many of you will. Kind of just wanted to include this one on the list uh, just because I was excited to talk about him. Uh, interesting guy, an interesting case for me to look at, though I think pretty much every other wide receiver I talked about at this point seems to be a better pickup than him. So just to put some honesty into that and that rounds out our wide receivers. So now we're gonna move on to the running backs who there is far, far, far less running backs to discuss. So this video is probably gonna pick up pace quite a bit. And I guess that's why, and Rob and I were just talking about this on the phone, this idea of, I would probably trade one of your good wideouts for a running back if that's what you're looking for right now because that talent, probably not gonna be on the waiver wire if you need it. So here at 27% available, we've got uh, running back Devin Singletary. He is on a buy in week six, but it's not just about week six. We are projecting the season as a whole. If he is out there, now will be the time to capitalize on picking him up. This is a guy who came out. He looked really good in the first few games. In the first game, he had 17.5 yards per carry because he carried the ball four times for 70 yards. Uh, sure, that was a bit of a fluke. But then the next week, he had 9.5 yards per carry at 57 yards off of six carries and a touchdown. He looked very good in a 28 to 14 win over the Giants. Not to mention over that same time period, he caught five of his six targets for 28 yards. That's 5.6 yards per reception. Um, this is a very versatile back in that backfield. He looks very good and he was drafted to do exactly what he was doing in those games. Now, he reminds me very much of the Miles Sanders situation there with uh, Jordan Howard being that I think there's a Frank Gore and Howard being the older guys who are better bruisers, maybe a little bit more north-south, more dependable, safer options that those coaches are sort of leaning on right now. Um, certainly, Devin Singletary had a huge setback in that injury. Um, what I'm expecting from both of those guys, Miles Sanders and Devin Singletary, though we're not talking about Sanders, so maybe I should just stick to Singletary, being that... I think we need probably three or four weeks of solid gameplay, of, of just solid on the field numbers for the coach to start to use him and to start to implement him as the lead back in that offense. He's going to get usage week one as soon as he's back and healthy, so don't worry about it. Um, as far as that aspect goes, but for him to overtake Frank Gore, who's had some good games in his absence, um, this injury has really set him back a few weeks. And, and again, I think I was talking to somebody earlier and what I said was really he's back at square one and earning a role in that offense. He's very talented and it will happen. The question is when? I wanted to take a second and talk about Tevin Coleman um, and Raheem Mostart. I'm constantly getting questions of people saying, hey, Tevin Coleman is back and he has 29% available. Should I pick him up? These are both guys who need to be monitored and considered. I threw Raheem Mostart in here because he is 72% available. And while people are not considering him nearly as much, I like him a lot. And I actually, of those two, I like Mostart more. Now, Matt Brightis seems to be the main back in that offense. And what I really wanted to say is, boom, there's Matt Breida, there's Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostart, and they've all looked and shown some talent, but none of them have shown to be the guy. I think it's a situation you have to avoid. And what I really wrote down, and in the end, I'm going to say, unless you're a desperate at running back, this is a situation to monitor but not act on at this time. And I know that some of you guys are going to have to pull the trigger finger on that. You're going to have to go, boom, and get this guy in just desperate hopes of getting another running back. Uh, but again, this is a situation where if you're at that point with your raw Foster, I would advise doing what I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, what Rob was talking about earlier to me today, was this idea of trade a wideout away. Trade a wideout away. There's so much receiver talent out there. There's so many wideouts. I cut wide receivers out that I wanted to talk about because this video was going to be too long. I did the opposite for running backs. I'm trying to force these guys in there, but they're just not good enough for me to talk about. And so if you're considering Tevin Coleman and picking him up, yeah, you could probably do that if you have a deep bench. I would consider making a move to upgrade your running backs. That's what I would do. I'm a very running back heavy guy. If you're a no running back strategy sort of person, you're probably not going to get along with me so much. Although I guess you don't need to get along with me. You need to get along with the research and the numbers, which really seem to prove that I think you got to have some better options than that. But I'm not going to waste any more of your time on this situation that I feel like I have pretty much only fluff to say and nothing too dramatically important. So let's move on. 
Uh, in yet another video, I'm going to take a quick brief second to talk about Carlos Hyde because he is still 34% available. This guy has played in five games this year, and every single game he has looked a little bit better. And that's just me as far as maybe it's on the field, maybe it, he looked worse statistically, uh, but he had a tougher matchup, whatever. I feel like he's improved. In the last three weeks, he has had better fantasy numbers three weeks ago. He had 7.9, then 10.4, then 14 last week. Last week, he had 21 carries for 60 yards and a touchdown in a 53-32 win over the Atlanta Falcons. And that's exactly what I wanted to talk about because I think we're going to see bigger and better fantasy numbers from Carlos Hyde as we continue to see games like this from Houston. They've played teams like Carolina, surprisingly good. Uh, the Chargers, good. Jacksonville, surprisingly good. And New Orleans, very good. And so I think they're going to get a, um, a mix of some easier matchups later in the year. Not every matchup, but they're going to get some easier games like they had against Atlanta this week. And in those sort of games, Carlos Hyde has a lot more value and, and could even possibly be streamed and started. Carlos Hyde should absolutely be picked up. He is a dependable guy, um, and I like him, especially capital again in that standard league set of scoring all right so we've got Ronald Jones jr. excuse me really strong to speak here but 34% available is a guy you need to pick up he comes out week one he is a surprise 13 carries for 75 yards and then boom against Carolina he disappears for just nine yards rushing um, and people are really left wondering what's going on uh, but we advise leaning towards um, him over Peyton Barber because he was younger and he had more upside. Sure enough, in week three, he has 13 fantasy points off of 80 rushing yards. And in week four against the Rams, he has 70 rushing yards, 19 carries, and a touchdown. He struggled last week against the New Orleans Saints, but they lost 31-24. to 24. So you have to understand kind of game scripts. They were throwing a lot. They couldn't run the ball a lot. And the Saints have a very good run defense, a very good run defense. Do not underestimate that. Again, the uh, Saints have allowed the fifth fewest fan points to running backs I think that number is very skewed look to him to have big games later in the year when he's able to capitalize on better matchups he is trending up big time get him now while you can 34% available is Ronald Jones Jr. All right, so what about running back Kenyon Drake? One of the reasons I want to talk about him is simply that he is 45% available. And again, want to get a few guys out there who are at least a little bit more available because um, running back position is not loaded with talent. And he is far from the most amazing running back out there, but he's been improving this year. We really came into this season with a lot of news about Kalen Blash supposed to be the guy. But sure enough, Kalen Balazs has been a complete disappointment, and coaches are learning Drake is the better back. He comes out and has 4.7 points in week one, then 9.8, then 10.2, then 12.3 fantasy points. Every single week he has improved. This week he had a bye week, um, and so he's going to be coming fresh and healthy into a week five versus the Washington Redskins. This could very well be a breakout game for him. This is probably going to be the first game the Dolphins have had all year that isn't a complete blowout. This could actually be a somewhat close match. It's also the easiest matchup he has had all year long. Not only has he been in blowouts where he's simply not used in the running game as much as he could be, but he's very versatile and used in the passing game, um, but he's just had tough matchups. Week one against Baltimore, week two against New England, then Dallas, then the Chargers. Those are some good teams, and that is a less than ideal schedule to be playing against. And so definitely looking up this week against Washington coming off of a bye week. Kenyon Drake, far from the most exciting player, but the best back in that offense and 45% available. And I believe this is the last running back I'm going to talk about, which is running back Ido Smith. He is 86% available, and he's a guy who is far from phenomenal. But he had five carries for 19 yards, a yet another week where he had a better yards per carry than Devonta Freeman. I've been saying this for weeks. There's going to come a point in the season where the Atlanta Falcons have got to move on from Devonta Freeman. And I think they were hesitant to do that because for years Freeman was their guy and because he was more versatile, more usable in the passing game. But that is starting to not be as strong of an argument as last week, this last game. Ido Smith went out there, had six targets, six catches, and 45 yards and made a bold statement that says, hey, Falcons coaching staff... He's not the only guy that can catch the ball. I, however, am the only guy who can run the ball. I think that we're going to see increased carries from him, increased snaps, time on the field, touches. Ido Smith, by the end of the season, at least in my prediction, is going to be the back in that offense for certain. And he's very highly available at 86%. 
go snag this guy while you can. He's a really solid guy. He was a nice guy to round off the running backs. And now we're going to move on to the quarterbacks. And so the first quarterback I wanted to talk about is Drew Brees. He is 23% available, and he will not be playing this week, but I do wanted to give an update for some guys because he is too talented not to know about. Uh, reports are coming out that his uh, recovery from injury is going much faster than normal. He's a guy who's very competitive. I love watching pregame for the Saints while Brees has been out because he's been warming up with the team like he's going to play. It's great. He has such a competitive spirit. He absolutely wants to be out there. Now, he's not expected to return until week 10. They have a week 9 bye, and week 10 is, is really when he's expected to return. But I'm not going to get into this too much. I'm just going to let you guys know. Check out our Friday video, and that's when I will do a proper update on quarterback Drew Brees. I almost called him a wide receiver. But anyways, we'll move on now to some other quarterbacks who have more immediate fantasy value. First guy is Jimmy Garoppolo. He is 41% available and a streaming option for those of you in two quarterback leagues, deep leagues, or looking for a bench QB. Um, he faces the Rams coming up, and Russell Wilson and Jameis Winston have absolutely lit up that Rams defense the last two weeks. And maybe Jimmy Garoppolo comes in, and he's the third quarterback in a row to do that. Now, Jimmy Garoppolo is by no means Russell Wilson, and that 49ers offense is by no means that Buccaneers offense but is a favorable matchup. Not maybe the most exciting quarterback start that I like this week, but if you're desperate, you could play Jimmy Garoppolo. I've got some better options that we're going to talk about here in a moment. How about quarterback Matthew Stafford? He plays Green Bay this week coming up, and he's a guy who is, um, as far as plus 20-yard passing attempts down the field, he has doubled his rate. I said that a little bit confusing. Um, basically what I'm saying is, Last year, his ratio of passes that go deep, which is at least 20 yards, has doubled from last year. That Lions team is airing it out. They're throwing the ball a lot deeper, and I think that that's boding very well for him. And, of course, with Marvin Jones there that's been stepping it up lately, that also helps him quite a bit. But I think the biggest thing that I like about this is that he plays the Packers. The Packers, the last two games' scores have been 34-27 to and 34-24, to and so – there were a week where the Lions could put up some points against a divisional opponent in the Packers. That, that trend could very well continue this week for Matthew Stafford. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the season, I'm surprised that we're talking about this guy because at the beginning of the season, we wouldn't have been projecting to. But Gardner Minshew, he is 77% available. And I, again, I'm surprised to be saying this, but he has played well and his wide receivers, his options are good. Leonard Fournette out of the backfield. DJ Chark has been on fire and DD Westbrook has been a really good number two wide receiver there for him to fall back on as sort of that PPR safety blanket sort of guy. And so I like him this week. In fact, he scored at least 17 fantasy points every Every single game this year uh, the Gardner Minshew hype is for a reason. There are always rookies people get hyped on for no reason, but this is not for no reason. Gardner Minshew, and he plays the Saints this week, that is a tough defense, but a better run defense than pass defense. So you have to note that if the Jaguars are going to put up points and win that game, it is going to be off of their passing attack. Not a safe start, but if you are looking for a play, Gardner Minshew, a guy to pick up, a guy to stash on your bench, huge upside, uh, definitely for sure. But let's move on to our other two quarterbacks before we finish this video out. We have got Kyle Allen. Uh, he's a guy who's really come back down to earth, but he's got a good matchup against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so that bodes very well for him, and he's 90% available for those of you weirdos in two quarterback leagues, which is apparently getting very common. Um, and then one last guy that I would like to talk about before we finish out this video is Teddy Bridgewater, 92% available versus the Jaguars. He threw four touchdowns last week and really redeemed himself, showing he's got some huge potential and can, can be good in a solid matchup in the right game. So Teddy Bridgewater and Kyle Allen are the last two QBs that I wanted to discuss. And what am I thinking? I've got to cover tight ends and defenses. So no, this video is not just about done, but um, I guess I just wanted to be it's late and I'm tired. So we got tight end Gerald Everett. He's been a very positive surprise for the Rams. He's 92% available, by the way. I always seem to skip that. But the last two games, he has really stepped it up. Two weeks ago against Tampa Bay, he had 15 fantasy points, 44 yards, and a touchdown. He even even better last week against Seattle. Um, so he had, what, 25.6 fantasy points off of 11 targets, 7 catches, and 136 yards. I highly doubt that this guy is going to continue the way he's been the last two weeks. But... 
I think you got to at least monitor this guy, maybe pick him up if you've got the roster spot. Wait and see. Um, he's got definitely some potential. With the amount of weapons in that offense, we don't even need to sit here and talk about how loaded the Rams are. I don't think that he's going to be able to continue this. But if he does, you'll be kicking yourself if you don't have him. So at least keep him on your radar. Uh, we got Ricky Seals-Jones, 96% available. Now, he is yet to play his Week 5 game because I'm recording this late Sunday night, and he plays a Monday game. But last week, he had three catches for 80-plus yards and a touchdown. So I wanted to just give a little shout-out and say, hey, guys, pay attention to that Monday game. If Ricky Seals-Jones does anything like what he did last week, he's worth a pickup, absolutely worth a pickup. He could definitely play flat, and then that turns into a different discussion of which of the two weeks do we trust. But if he has another good week, you should definitely target this guy. And I believe I have one more tight end to discuss. And that is James O'Shaughnessy. Uh, the last three weeks have been good to him. Um, and his production hasn't been far from amazing, but has been consistent. He's going to get you about three or four catches, about four or five targets. He had back-to-back -to -back touchdowns two weeks ago. And last week, he had four targets, three catches, and 57 yards. He did this despite playing Tennessee, Denver, and Carolina the last three weeks. And four weeks ago, in a 13-12 to loss to Houston, that was very low scoring. So this is a guy to continue to monitor We'll see what he does late in the season, and maybe he's able to capitalize on some easier matchups coming up. Uh, he's a guy that I'm less than excited them, and I'm not going to put him on my roster. Again, at 98% available, most people in your league won't even be looking at him. But as always, you want to be the first to know. I've been saying this a lot lately, but the early bird gets the worm. I am not a morning person when it comes to fantasy. I definitely would like to consider myself, quote unquote, an early bird. And this might be one of those guys who could come in and fill an injured tight end for you or replace or whatever it might be. So make sure to pay attention to him. And let's round this video out with some defenses and I believe a kicker that I'd like to talk about. So the last few things you got to consider, Carolina, 50% available playing against Tampa Bay gives up the fifth most fantasy points. They're a good offense, but with Jameis Winston on the helm, fumbles and interceptions are very likely. They also have a touchdown last week and 41 fantasy points in the last three weeks. So Carolina, definitely good to consider. Green Bay is 70% available and plays Detroit this week. So that is also a great matchup to consider. In four or five games this year, they've had good fantasy numbers. The last defense I want to talk about was Tampa Bay Bucks, 91% available, and they're actually currently third in uh, fantasy scoring among defenses, and they play the Panthers. Kyle Allen has actually been surprisingly good, but he's also not been amazing. He's just been okay. He's been very hot and very cold. They could very well capitalize on that matchup, and at 91% available, odds are they are out there in a league for you to pick up. Mike Nugent, he was picked up by the Patriots, and he is replacing on IR Steven Goskowski. He had eight fantasy points. He had two extra points and two field goals, and he has huge value in that offense. He's not an elite kicker, but the way that Steven Goskowski was actually starting to struggle a little bit this season, Mike Nugent is not much of a downgrade, and he holds value maintained simply by being in that awesome Patriots roster. Last thing I want to consider uh, mentioning was Hunter Henry. He was spotted practicing this last week, um, and so a return definitely seems soon. Uh, don't pick him up until he returns, but he played in one game this year. He had five targets, four catches, and 40 yards that equated to 10 fantasy points. Those numbers are not insane, but are you going to get a tight end like Hunter Henry at this point in the season? Probably not. Monitor him. Keep him on your radar. If you've got a dead weight on your bench player, drop him. Pick this guy up. Wait and see. Who knows? So hopefully that helped round out this video and give you guys a lot of options. This was a very long video and it covered a lot of information, so hopefully it helped. The last thing that I wanted to do to you guys, uh, do and talk with you guys was about catching you up with everything that's been happening. Rob is now at the Children's Epilepsy Hospital with my sister Gabby, so if you could pray for her, that would be fantastic. Um, part of the emergency room the other day, she came back, we were thinking things were a little bit better, but she really regressed again as having some major issues with her epilepsy. It's starting to get very scary and very difficult for us here in our family. So I'd appreciate your support. Funny thing is Rob absolutely adores you guys in this channel. That's not a phrase I ever thought I'd say. Came across a little creepy, but um, so don't take that the wrong way. But um, you know what he said? You still got to produce the video today, Christian, because he said this is the one thing that seems to be going well right now. And so uh, he really does appreciate your guys' support. 
And so I don't like to do this often. I don't like to beg for comments and for likes and for subscribers and things like that. But if you guys could leave as many comments as possible, leave as many likes as possible, subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Let's like let's have this be a good video. Rob has had a very tough time. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people in my family has had a tough time, and I'd love to you know see some support around that. That would be truly great. Again. Sounds like a very weird request, request, but this channel is very important to him. And guys, I really seriously thank you so much for the support. This channel is very important to me as well. And uh, you know what? I'm just going to finish it off here. As always, you guys have a great day and God bless.